Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up the past 24 or so hours. If you luck, you're having an amazing day. I'd like to start this video out with AMD, specifically news concerning the next generation of AMD graphics cards, or Big Nave if you prefer, or RDNA second generation, whatever the hell you want to call it. There is a tweet which has popped up yesterday, and Twitter user Cyberpunk Cat shares an image which has just made every single tech website go ballistic. And these are alleged specifications of the RX 5950 XT. We'll quickly go over the specs. Uh, 5120 shaders, or if you prefer, 80 compute units, 320 TMUs, 96 ROPs. 12 megabytes of level 2 cache, 24 gigabytes of HBM2E, which has a total bandwidth of 2 terabytes per second, and the name is the 5950XT, as I mentioned. So, I am going to go ahead and say that I'm super duper skeptical of these specifications for a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to go into every single reason because otherwise the video would be really long on just this topic alone. So I'm going to just cherry pick a few examples. So first of all, 5120 shading units seems right to me. Several of my own sources have told me we're looking at up to 80 compute units, uh, for the big Narve. There's Narve 21 and 23 that I know about for consumers. Um, I'm getting mixed messages of which of the two is the higher end skew. One of my sources called Narve 23 the Nvidia killer, but someone else is adamant that Narve 21 is the one with the more compute units. I don't know which one's which, uh, because as I said, I'm getting mixed messages there. But what I can tell you is that I've been told that they're extremely impressive and they're actually shaping up perhaps even better than what AMD had originally anticipated. Either way, 80 compute units I don't have any problems with. 320 TMUs I also have no real issues with. 96 ROPs would be unusual. Um, an odd number like that would typically be something you see with NVIDIA. 96 ROPs would be unusual for AMD. Another problem I have with these specifications is that 96 ROPs would imply that there's three SEs on the GPU, which does not divide evenly into 80 compute units. So it's potentially possible that this has actually been cut down from a larger number of compute units. But if this is kind of marketing literature, why isn't the highest number of compute units what's listed rather than this cut down number, unless AMD are manufacturing this GPU with the intention of never actually releasing a fully working die, which would also be kind of weird. Given we don't know how the... Uh, basically the block diagram looks for the second generation of RDNA, I can't really be that definitive. The level 2 cache is 12 megabytes, which is ginormous. It's three times larger than the RX 5700 XT and the Narve uh, 10 silicon. So even if you say that the Narve 10 silicon's 40 compute units is times by two, we're still looking at a massive disparity from the amount of cache there versus here. One thing I have been told by a couple of people is that the second generation of RDNA has improvements with the cache system. Um, I'm going to be a bit ambiguous for now because I've been asked to keep some specific details kind of cagey, but I can tell you that I don't know the exact uh, memory configuration of the level 2 cache, but I have been told that there is some enhancements for the cache of the second generation of RDNA, um, but whether that would account for that additional 4 megabytes, I can't tell you. Um, the memory configuration of the HBM2, 2 terabytes of memory bandwidth is a lot. Just picking on the RX 5700 XT again, that has 448 gigabytes per second thanks to its uh, combination of uh, GDDR6 and 256-bit bus. So, we are looking at over four times the amount of memory bandwidth, but even if you say that we're looking at over double the number of shaders plus additional clock frequency, which has not been confirmed, pass overhead for ray tracing, you also take into account that we are presumably looking at a better caching system, perhaps better um, 
overall efficiency in terms of the memory system anyway, maybe better compression, yada yada yada. I just don't see any reason at all that this amount of memory bandwidth would be required. That's not to say they couldn't do it, the configuration would be a bit weird, um, and that's assuming there is no typos in these internal documents, which also would not be unusual, I have seen those before. Indeed, I've actually been sent reviewer's guides with typos, let alone internal documents like this. Um, but here, uh, a, a Twitter user Hans Dave Rees, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, if not I apologise, um, he points out that SK Humux have shown off uh, HBM2 stacks, which are 512 gigabytes per second, and that was just last week at the ISSCC 2020. So it's technically possible, but that would be really expensive uh, for a consumer-grade part. Then again, maybe this is for a GPU which is more the prosumer lineup, but then the name of the 5950XT, that wouldn't necessarily make sense. Maybe, though, that text is not relevant to these specs. I don't know. Um, I'm just t telling you how I'm seeing it. As for HBM2, uh, HBM2E to be precise, well, it's not out of the realms of potentials for them to do that, but the other problem I have with it, it's quite expensive. So, I kind of expect HBM2 to not be present on uh, consumer-grade products. Maybe with the exception of, like, uh, prosumer cards. I guess the equivalent of, like, uh, I don't know, the uh, Titans from NVIDIA. Then again, um, there is one benefit, of course, and that is not only, well, aside from obvious things like lots of memory bandwidth, but the other thing is reduced power consumption. So let's just, for the sake of argument, say that they're going for, like, a 384-bit GDDR6 bus, or even a 512 but GDDR6 bus, that's eating up a lot of power, and HBM2 requires a lot less power. So, obviously, those things are just something that AMD would need to take into consideration. You could have kind of a chunky memory configuration for GDDR6, and that could be eating up 40, 50, 60, or whatever watts of power, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but when you factor in a... GPU top tier could be 200, 250, 300 watts, you can start to see how just like nomming, let's say 50 or 60 watts of that can be a thing. Um, then again, I also speak with a lot of ignorance consuming, uh, concerning what the um, power draw is for the next generation of RDNA. I put out a video according to one of my sources, it's much improved, but <laughs> then you're looking at over double the amount of compute units, so there's only a certain amount they can do. Uh, I would be super duper curious to see. The last thing, um, and I'm going to harp on for the name for a second, the 5950 XT, I'm just super skeptical of the name. A really good source of mine, uh, the same source who gave me the Radeon 7 uh, information before the cards launched, as well as the renders of the cards, they told me they're almost certain the cards are going to launch around summer-ish, although they don't have a specific release date as of the last time I spoke to them. And they also believe that the cards are going to be the RX 6000 series. But honestly, if you're AMD and you work in their marketing department, what on earth reason would you call the cards the RX 5000 series? The RX 5000 series and the hype surrounding them is largely dead. Um, whereas the RX 6000 series you would associate with a new product, a new generation, a new architecture, which is essentially what the RX 6000 series would be. You've also got the whole thing of then, you're trying to just imagine from a, a person who doesn't necessarily know lots about technology, you'd be like, well, okay, well, the RX, I'm just going to say the, the 5800 series would have uh, ray tracing because maybe that's the 60 the 56 compute unit variant and then the rx 5700 series doesn't have ray tracing it's going to be super confusing for people i think it's always good sometime uh, i think it's always good when you're moving to a different generation just to make it really bloody clear and obvious and yeah that's one of the reasons that i believe the name is going to change as well and now I'd like to uh, quickly tackle a piece of Resident Evil 3 news. This is very outside the, uh, uh, I guess, topics of the video, aside from that, but uh, it's just something I'm interested in. For those who are super duper excited about Resident Evil 3, 
you might like to know that uh, Capcom have confirmed that there will be a demo which will release soon, although no details as to the systems or the timing. They've just said it's going to come soon. Anyway, um, getting back onto the tech stuff. So I want to finish the video off with a couple of small updates for the next generation Xbox. Albert Pinello, who is of course the former executive over at uh, Microsoft heading up the Xbox division, confirms that 12 TFLOPs RDNA 2 was always the plan. Basically nothing here has changed since uh, he left the company. They always have had these plans internally. Obviously he couldn't reveal that until now because of NDAs and stuff like that. But I think this kind of solidifies a couple of things. One... When it comes to consoles, they don't just kind of make it up as they go along. And I know uh, engineers who are listening to this video are like, well, really, you don't say. But I'm just trying to point out that a lot of these plans are known quite a long time in advance. They have access to companies' roadmaps and targets, so they, they kind of know this. But the 12 t flop thing doesn't surprise me anyway. Um, I mentioned a couple of times on this channel that I actually saw some internal documentation from super early on in the console's uh, design cycle, and it did point to a 10 T-flop plus machine. The 10 T-flops was a minimum target, and I, I don't know the exact date of the internal documentation. It doesn't spe specify something like, you know, January 3rd, 2016, or something like that, but... I can tell you it was super early. It was obviously before they'd really started to even touch the hardware and to really start to design it. And they were targeting 10 T-flops even back then. So I think it was pretty clear that uh, the company kind of knew what they were looking for. Next, I'd like to touch on some comments from Phil Spencer during our podcast. And I find these comments rather fascinating as he details several things, not least of which is what his vision of the cloud is, as well as local gaming, for the next decade or so. In his mind, consoles are not going to be disappearing for at least 10 years. Um, I'm going to read out the quote of verbatim. I think getting to a world where we don't have to own one device to play specific games helps the industry. That doesn't mean owning a device isn't part of my experience. I think I'm going to have a console plugged into my television for the next decade plus. The best way for me to play on my television is to have a local device to download and play the game. But sometimes I'm not in front of my television. Sometimes I'm not in front of a device with native gaming capabilities. And that our bet on the cloud gaming is. For us, we think it's great when everyone plays and we all win. But the cloud is really just a means to the end. Spencer also reiterated that he loves the idea of being able to just play on any screen on the house and basically throw content or stream content, games in other words, to whatever screen you have available. Kind of like how you can with Netflix or, you know, YouTube, where you could be watching YouTube on your phone, go home, and then be like, oh, you know what, I'm halfway through this video, and uh, I'm just going to continue to watch this redgamingtech.com video on the TV, because it's bigger and looks shiny. I mean, that just is awesome, right? And I think he kind of uh, is alluding to a very similar vision for gaming, which honestly, I kind of like as well. Imagine being able to play a game remotely, and then you're like, oh, I'm almost home from work. You know, you're you just get off the, the train or whatever. You've got like a 10-minute walk to your, to your place. So you kind of pause the game, get home, make yourself some food. Uh, the game's still on pause. And then you're like, okay, well, I can just now continue. And then you just press a couple of buttons. And then the game picks up right where you left off on your local Xbox. And then you can enjoy the big screen experience. I think that's really cool. He also adds that he'd like... Uh, for Sony as well as Nintendo to continue to be industry le leaders who feels that the industry owes them a lot and feels that if they continue to be strong we as gamers will definitely benefit which I totally agree with. I'll link of course the uh, full um, discussion from Phil in the description of the video so I'd go ahead and uh, suggest that you check it out. Um, so my thoughts here are actually very close to that of uh, Phil. I actually really like how he's coming across there and I must admit I'm not 
I'm not against cloud gaming. I'm not someone who's like, oh no, it's scary. But simultaneously, I do love the idea of having local gaming machines and actually having a console. And yeah, so I'm I'm going to be very curious to see what Microsoft and Sony's vision is for the next generation of gaming. I think it's going to be super duper interesting. Um, but with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment and subscribe. And thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.